I'll tell you, I'm very impressed. Amanda has seemed to time the end of those commercials almost perfectly with our restart time. So Amanda and, and staff there at Virginia Ed Strategies, thank you so much for facilitating this for us today. And also I would like to once again, uh, be sure that, that I thank our sponsors for making this summit possible. Uh, but I think everybody has a copy of all of our sponsors. Be sure um, that you consider all of them as you're doing business in regards to school infrastructure and even in uh, online learning environments. We had a lot of great sponsors that made this possible and I can't tell you how much we really, really appreciated that. And so um, with that, I will, uh, Mr. Blevins, are you here with us with Benefit Plan Administrators to introduce our next panel discussion? All right, we may have to come back to you again at the end. Christy somerville Majette, Superintendent in Brunswick County is going to be our moderator for our final session and the panel discussion that we have planned. So at this time, Christy, I will turn the mic over to you. All right, perfect. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'd like to, if you don't mind, Keith, I'm just going to go ahead and do the introduction of our uh, fellow panelists. I'll make up for this morning, everyone. Um, on our panel this afternoon, we have uh, Mr. Paul Nichols. He's the superintendent of our schools for Mecklenburg County Public Schools where he served for six years. He's a native of Southern Virginia and has served as a teacher, school counselor, and or administrator in four of the school divisions in this area. Additionally, Paul has served with the Southern Virginia VDOE Best Practice Center and is a first president executive director of the Virginia Advanced Study Strategies, now it's Virginia Ed Strategies. Also on the panel, we have let's see, um, Dr. Kevin Sires. Sears, I apologize, Sears. He currently serves as a superintendent for Pulaski Public Schools. He previously served as a superintendent of schools in Monroe County, West Virginia, a high school administrator in Virginia, and is an elementary and middle school teacher in North Carolina. He's a veteran of the US Army and served on three deployments as part of Operation Joint Endeavor, Operation Noble Eagle, and Operation Iraqi Freedom. In addition to these gentlemen, we also have, I have your bio, um, Dr. Turner. He currently serves as a superintendent of Colonial Beach Public Schools. Dr. Turner has served in administrative capacities in rural and urban school settings. And we also have Mrs. Haiti Robinson that serves as the superintendent in Dickinson County Schools. So I'm really excited to uh, talk with these fine uh, colleagues this afternoon. And before I get started with them, I just want to put a plug in. Keith, we do appreciate your leadership and commitment because this conference, I've learned so much today, and it really shines a light on just the dire need for funding and new facilities in our small and rural schools to support our children. So just, I know I speak on behalf of all of us that we really appreciate it. So this afternoon, I would like to, I have a few questions for you all, and I'd like to start probably with you, Mr. Nichols. Um, I'd like for you to share information regarding your division, how many schools are in your division or were in your division, and what was the condition of the school that you replaced? Uh, thank you, Christy. I uh, hope that everybody can hear me okay. Uh, if you're looking at me, you can see that there's, uh, I'm sort of fading in and out of a picture that's in the background. That is the new building that we're putting in place. Uh, Mecklenburg County has a long history of being a divided county east and west. It's almost like serving two school divisions because we have two, two elementary schools on the east end and two elementary schools on the west end, each one serving um, a east end middle school, east end, west end middle school, the east end high school and west end high school. For those of you that may be familiar, the east end middle and high schools are Parkview middle and high, west end are uh, Bluestone middle and high schools. And uh, so we have eight all together. Uh, the buildings, there was one building project about 2005 in South Hill, it was a new South Hill Elementary School that was built. And uh, I think two or three other smaller elementary schools were actually brought into that as, and consolidated into that uh, building. Uh, all of the other buildings were built in the 50s and uh, have been around for a long time. Um, they're very hard to maintain. There's been a need and there's been conversation in our county for ever since the, the 70s actually to be looking at building some new facilities. So it's been a lot of conversation about this. Uh, 
our program, our program right now is a consolidated middle and high school together. So it is putting Bluestone Middle and Parkview Middle School together. If you look at the building that goes on the picture behind me, it's the one uh, over on your left, this area right over in here. I can't get my hand to look at it just right, but this is the middle school section. High school sections over on this end with gyms and um, the shared kitchen facilities, separate cafeterias. One of the things that's been very important to us as we put this project together is the whole idea that it's not just gonna serve the academic needs of our students, but it's gonna serve the needs of the community uh, to bring them together. So for industrial uh, economic development. And so we have a 1200 seat auditorium being built into it. We also have over 300 acres that will be a part of the uh, six career academies. We're making it a smaller school within a large school environment with six career academies that's helping students move forward into the future. The six career academies are the environmental sciences that are uh, the agriculture and the catering programs. We've got an international business and culture academy that's doing our fine arts as well as business and culture from an international perspective. We've got a science, technology, engineering, and math, which is many of traditional plus engineering. We've got a law and leadership program, which is based on our JROTC program, along with the whole um, fire science, police science, things of that nature. There's a health and human services, which is our uh, health programs and uh, Teach for Tomorrow programs and so forth, and then advanced technology. So each one has their own colors, each one has their own shirts. We have a workforce development coordinator now that is really working with partnership with the businesses, that businesses have their logos and colors on the walls of the schools. And uh, we, the students will all spend at least 40 hours out getting a good opportunity to do some engagement with the friendship or uh, things of that nature. Awesome. So it's been a uh, long time coming, but it's a great program. Awesome. Thank you, Paul. And I'm going to get you to, um, we'll circle back to some of that uh, in just a few um, so that you can elaborate more so we can glean some information from that. So um, I'm going to take it to Mrs. Robinson. If you could just sort of answer the same question, just regarding in terms of the condition of the school that you replaced and how many schools are currently uh, in your division or were in your division prior to your new construction. You're on mute. Thank you so much. You. Uh, and it's great to be a part of this panel and, and uh, thank you for inviting me. Uh, when I first came to Dixon County in 2009, uh, we had nine schools um, and um, the forefathers of, of schools that were built 50 or 60 years ago um, had the wisdom to build them on the floodplain. Uh, I say that kiddingly, but that is what has helped us, the small rural county, uh, to build uh, with, the, with the assistance of the U.S. Corps of Engineers um, a school that um, uh, had three high schools, a career center, and a middle school. So at Ridgeview campus, we have grades 6 through 12, and we also have um, a career center. Uh, with all of the athletic fields. And as uh, uh, Dr. Nichols, I think I could very well relate to what you were saying, sir, because um, the school very quickly became um, the community. And that's what we've always wanted there. It's also an emergency shelter. Uh, we have um, natural uh, gas there and generators. Um, in 2009, uh, for many of us, we suffered a just a um, traumatic ice storm for weeks and people were, did not have uh, power. They were, it was very cold um, that year. And so we were able to provide an emergency shelter also in our school. So grades six through 12 are housed in this school now. Um, and the career technical school is across the street. And so um, they can go there for um, automotive, um, you know, those kinds of shops. Uh, but then the nursing, culinary arts, uh, cosmetology, um, all of that, uh, drafting, 
um, is it located in the building? And so all they have to do is just go across the hall or down um, the steps and there they are. So thank you. Thank you. All right, Dr. Turner and then Dr. Sears. Hello. Uh, so the school that, that, and I must first start off by saying that I was not the superintendent when um, our elementary school was replaced, but we have two schools on our campus, uh, roughly 650 students all together. Um, our elementary school was replaced uh, back, I believe, in 2017 due to a, due to a fire. And so um, that school was a seasoned building. You know, we don't like to say old, but it was a seasoned building that lacked some functionality. And unfortunately, we had an arson uh, situation that, that caused that building to burn down. So and we were also, the elementary school was, was taking advantage of modular units. So there was some safety and security concerns from that aspect. So right now we are very happy with the, with the current elementary school that we have on the campus. Thank you. Dr. Sears. Okay, thank you. Um, I will say it, our schools were old and arson probably would have done about a million dollars worth of improvement had somebody take, had the foresight to have set the fire. It, uh, you know, we, we had two uh, 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 age middle schools. Uh, one uh, was built in the 1920s with an addition in 1952. The other one was built in 1952. Uh, Several years ago, the walls had started separating from the building around the gym, so they had to put in steel supports to keep the walls from falling off. Uh, the window panes were busted out and, and uh, they could not be replaced. They were the one, uh, one square foot window panes um, that were uh, sealed with asbestos, uh, some type of asbestos coating. So to, to replace, you know, a, a $2 pain would cost you $2,000 in asbestos abatement. So you'd have to wait till you had, a, you know, a 20 or 30 pains out before it was worth your while to, to pay for the abatement and have the, the, the pains replaced. Uh, our classrooms had uh, either one or two outlets in them. In many cases, the one or two outlets didn't work. Uh, no air conditioning, uh, an ancient heating system in, in both buildings. Uh, you know, just, just to put it in perspective, I, I interviewed for this position in the summer of 2016, and in preparation for that, I drove out to, to check out the facilities, uh, drove past all the schools, and when I went past Pulaski Middle School, I just assumed that was the old abandoned school and that uh, there was another one somewhere else that I couldn't find, and when I went for the interview and they said, no, that's our school, I, I, I nearly withdrew my name because I did not know how we were going to be able to keep kids safe or educate them in a building that was that dilapidated. And anyway, we, we consolidated both into Pulaski County Middle School. It's a, a $47 million top of the line middle school. It, it, uh, this is our first year in it and, and we've been able to, to, to do so much more with, with less staff and, and we're seeing our middle school enrollment actually tick up a little bit because uh, a lot of times we would lose our middle school students to neighboring counties and since we have the new building they have you know more are sticking with us so we're, we're thrilled with uh, having that, that new facility. Christy, if I can jump in, I would like to share why I invited each of these panelists to share their story. As you know, Paul is in process of building a new school there in Mecklenburg. Kevin just opened his new school right in the middle of a pandemic. Katie had her school built by one of the most unique financing models that I've ever heard of. And I'm telling you, I've been to schools all over our country. It is probably one of the, if not the, one of the most beautiful school facilities I've ever been to. And then with the Sean and Colonial Beach, I, I'm really jealous of what they did up there. They had, they had the lowest square footage cost per square foot of any new school build that I, I've ever been um, uh, aware of either. So that I thought all four of these would be excellent panelists. Sorry to interrupt, Christy. Oh, no, you're fine. It, it's, it's interesting. We all need this information. So I'm actually going to start with you, um, Mrs. Robinson. Can you just speak to your timeline from idea, design, construction, opening? I think I heard Paul say something earlier that it had been several years in the, in the making um, for them. But if you could just kind of talk about your process. Uh, yes, certainly. Uh, I, when I became a superintendent in 2009, my first marching orders 
were to find the money to find to build a school. Uh, we had three aging schools, uh, high schools, um, you know, 50, 60, 70 years plus. Um, the same kind of conditions that Mr. Sears uh, was talking about. And um, so I went to see our county administrator at that time and said, you know, um, very naively, uh, we need money to build a school. And of course, you know, I remember the laughter just complete, you know, and he's, he very kindly said to me, we don't have money and to build any schools. And we doubt that in Dixon County, you will ever find the money to build a school. And so then that caused me to begin to look at um, the plans and discussions that the US Corps of Engineers had had in Dixon County for several years and, and projects that um, just really just nearly died, you know, had gone away. And so I contacted uh, Huntington and told him who I was and, and just said, you know, is there any money to build schools in Dixon County? And that's really the way that it started. Um, uh, I think as Dr. Kerrigan said, um, it's Im unbelievable. And you have to understand that Dixon County received $110 million uh, to build new schools. The county had to match 5% of that. And um, so we went from nine just schools that were falling apart, uh, no hot water. I, I was I was like um, Dr. Sears, you know. We I remember going through. Um, I can't with COVID. You can't remember things, but we were going through some kind of flu, and and I was saying, you know, our students have to wash their hands in hot water, and and they said we don't have hot water, and I said in our bathrooms, and I said what. Well, we don't have hot water in our bathrooms. So that to me was just uh, appalling. The, the most appalling thing to me was that in each of our high schools, uh, because of the size of the schools, students could take different courses. So talk about discrimination, uh, talk about on inequality. You know, if you lived in this zip code with this high school, you might have this course, but if you lived in another one, you didn't. And so I could not, I, I just couldn't wrestle, couldn't really process how we were, how that was going on in our county. Um, and so I immediately started contacting the U.S. Corps of Engineers and, and uh, you know, I'm sure um, I've been told that, you know, they received many emails and calls from me, but that's the way the process started. So we were really blessed. Uh, in Dixon County. Uh, if you come to our county, um, it's a very small rural county. I don't think that we have a four lane highway. And then the only four lane highway that we have, by the way, is the one and the roundabout is the one that leads to the school. And so um, the thing that I remember about the design process was that I, I said this to the architect. I said, well, I want children when they first see Ridgeview to know that they're I can do anything. If I can, if I work, uh, if I do, I have the same opportunities as every other child uh, in this school and I can do anything because of this school. And I think um, when you see the school, um, I think, I hope children still get that feeling because I do, um, you know, we've, we've accomplished um, so much. And it wasn't just the school board, but it was the entire community coming together, uh, the IDA and the Board of Supervisors backing this project. Thank you. Thank you. And I know I'm going to circle back in a few because I do want to hear about the creative approach that you use to fund your school. So I will come back to that. Yes, um, ma'am. Dr. Turner, I know you said you came in midway of the process. Um, can you kind of speak to the timeline, just I guess from idea before it started? before you arrived into you all having construction and opening? I mean, I, I wish that I could. Um, I think my, my, my greatest asset to this, to this conversation would be around the impact on, on student learning thus far. Um, I was not a part of the timeline discussion. Um, I do know that the building, once again, they had um, that was burned down, um, was one that needed to be replaced. And I know that Dr. Newman at the time, the, Superintendent at that time led that particular conversation um, immediately. I know they worked closely with 
uh, the local, I mean, the architects, the school community, town council, and holding conversations around the need to build a new school and, and really made it happen in a short period of time. I believe in less than a, uh, the school was built in record time, maybe less, if not a year, less than a year and a half um, and, and opened on time to start the, the, the next school year. So, um, but, you know, unfortunately I didn't have that any responsibility at that time to the time. Okay. And that's fine. What you bring adds value anyway, because ultimately you think about many of us may be, be in a position that we come in the middle of a project or right at the end. So that's okay. Um, Dr. Sears and then Mr. Nichols. Thank you. Uh, we started having uh, uh, knockdown drag out fights with the Board of Supervisors in the fall of 2016. Uh, just about had it killed in the spring of 2017. Uh, took it to the public to plead our case and put a little pressure back on the Board of Supervisors uh, throughout the, the spring, late spring and summer of 2017 and got it put on a bond referendum. Uh, so November of 2017, it, it passed, the bond referendum passed by about a two thirds majority for the county. And it was a pretty significant tax increase of about 20% uh, uh, in, uh, 20 increase in their property taxes. But uh, it, it got us where we needed to be. And, and because everything was contingent on the bond referendum, we were really entered the project in, uh, you know, Kind of designing it as we went. We went ahead and, and had the early uh, grading package. We separated it into two bids, uh, one for an early grading package and then one for the building. And, and we got the design for the grounds uh, up and rolling quickly and put that out for bid. And, and so they started with the early grading package in the late winter of 2018, sometime around February or early March. And, and and then construction started in the fall of 2018, and uh, and we just had a, a, some luck with the weather, and were able to stay on schedule. And and, and throughout most of COVID, uh, we were we were doing well. Uh, got into the su last summer of 2020, and, and there was an outbreak of COVID on the construction site, and it shut things down for a week. So uh, um, that that put us a little late getting in, uh, but not too bad. We, our school opened on September 8th and our middle school students had to do the first week virtual, but they were able to come into the building the following week. in uh, so the, the fall of 2020. So from uh, the winter of 2018 to the fall of 2020 is what it took to construct the, the facility. Thank you, Mr. Nichols. Well, as I did mention, uh, this county has been talking about the need for new schools for several decades. Um, I came into this position in 2018. Uh, January of 2019, we had a conversation with the Board of Supervisors and the uh, school board that um, began the whole conversation. I'm sorry, I came in in 2015. 2016, January is when we started actually having a conversation about planning and how we would put it together. Would we build four schools? Would we build a school on the east end and one on the west end? Would we consolidate them? We had a pretty significant study that was done and some recommendations. Um, of course, both the Board of Supervisors and the school board had to make some plans. The, the Board of Supervisors let us know very early that uh, they were interested in building one consolidated school um, we had a little bit of kickback from a portion of our school board that probably postponed us for a year. There were some on the board, a majority of the board at that time that were still wanting to do too. Um, but we, we brought to the table a plan to use the career academies as a catalyst to make sure that everybody had the same opportunities to, to do work. And so there was a, an agreement to be able to move forward in uh, 2000, January of 2020, we had identified the, the uh, construction company that we wanted to work with, and they've been working on it and, and done a masterful job of putting the building together. We we're due to open in uh, a year uh, for the fall of 2022-23. Awesome, thank you. This next question is for anyone. Um, 
if you all could share any creative approaches that you use to build your new facility in terms of funding or any creative approaches that you use. I don't, I don't want to jeopardize the situation, but I will say that the, I really do believe that the whole piece that, that brought the community together and led to the support overall was the idea that we were going to move beyond the standards of learning. This was a little bit before the five C's came into fruition into the conversation from the state level, but we, we did look significantly at the careers, um, trying to find the best way to take advantage of the need for jobs and need for in, in, uh, industries to want to come into the area. Uh, we're very fortunate that uh, Microsoft had already determined to build the data center on the East Coast here in Mecklenburg County. Uh, that's been uh, a, a significant portion of what's gone on because we will have the largest data center in the world here by Microsoft in, not, in the very near future. They're, they're partially open, but they're continuing to build. Um, in fact, our taxes have not gone up at all because we've had that local support. That's been very creative and very, very much of a blessing to us. Um, and, and I think everybody, all the businesses have been really a big, in, significant interest and a big uh, partners and, and come to the table for that. So that's been the driving force. Thank you. I, I think uh, for us, you know, the, and, and I know how blessed we are when I say this, that the money, the financial part was not as big of an issue um, because we had the money there, but of course we had to go through with the core and, and get it, it was federal funds and, and all the things that you have to go through, those of you that have worked with that. So that in itself was, was uh, very challenging. I think for us was the fact that um, all of the all of the members of the board of supervisors and the IDA and the school board were united um, in that we had to do something uh, for our schools and our children, and this was the only opportunity that Dixon County was going to have, and so um, there was nothing. I think creative with that, except that we still had um, community resistance to consolidation. We had um, parents that they had attended school there, um, that we were closing their communities, uh, all of those other things. I remember one time uh, we were in a meeting and a parent stood up and, and said, uh, you know, our children um, don't need those fancy schools. Um, you know, that's, we didn't, we didn't have them and they didn't need them. So we were working with so, such extreme. We had all of this money available that we had to jump, you know, through a lot of procedures to get. And then we had a lot of community um, just didn't, didn't want that, you know, just did not want that for Dixon County. And so that was a, a, a just a trying time. Um, our rate, you know, Dixon County, their taxes have never, um, been paid. I mean, we increased because of this. And of course, that was always, oh, you're going to have to pay this and you're going to have to pay that. Um, one, one interesting issue, and I think this is kind of what began to, to uh, when people saw the campus and began to see that. And, you know, what we spent, we put together um, one, two, three, five schools in, on campus. And our uh, utility bills are less than what we paid in each of, in those five schools together. And one reason is that we have natural gas. And so we have natural gas heat and, and our kitchen is, is natural gas. So, you know, how do you argue when, you know, your utility bills in a, in a building that's, you know, over two, 275 square feet, a uh, thousand square feet, you know, you're paying more utility for five bu buildings than you are in that one. I think when people have saw the building and I think when they realized our children um, were, were going to be there. And the other issue for us was that we actually did have schools that were in the floodplain that had flooded. And, you know, it would be only a matter of time when those buildings would flood again. And um, the way that those buildings were, they were located, it's 
the buildings would flood, but getting the children out of the buildings um, on roads to travel home, you know, would also be a safety issue. So for us, it was a lot of, for us, I think the creative part was just educating our community of what this really meant um, and how this would impact children. Christy, if I could do a follow-up question with yeah, Haiti, I did that and one. also make a comment. Haiti, do you know of any other schools in the Commonwealth that have been built through the Army Corps of Engineers? I'm not aware of any, but I thought your story may be pertinent to folks because we may have other school divisions who have schools in floodplains. Well, Buchanan County um, is going through the same process as we are. And if anyone else is, is going through that, uh, please call us. Uh, I don't want to take up the time, but when the Corps first came to us, they were going to, um, they wanted to replace uh, a high school that had 140 students. Um, they wanted to build buildings for a school um, that was over 60 or 70 years old. And so part of what we had to go through was you know, why are we going to build a brand new building for a school now that has 140 students? And so it, the process was to get the core to understand, you know, if you will do this, we will not only move all the children out of harm's way, but then we'll also be able to provide this kind of building for all of our children. So it, it was kind of like, working with the core to say, this is the best bang for your buck, <laughs> okay? You know, you can build a building out here for $40 million and 140 students are gonna go and then you'll have to close it. I mean, who can, who can maintain that? Or we can build this facility and then look at what we can and still keep the core integrity, which is to, you know, move children to, to, set, to a high, you know, to a safer place. So yes, anytime, Keith, and we'd be more than happy. And, and I know that uh, um, Buchanan County and, and we're working very closely with them, um, you know, to help them go through this process. Thank you. And Keith Thank had you. the same question I did, Mrs. Robinson. Uh, anyone else in terms of that question, any creative approaches to how you were funded or to build your facility? All right, so my, um, this is a quick question and I didn't send this with the list, but what is, I need to know it for myself because we're finishing up a facility study process. What was your plan for your remaining facilities, the facilities that you closed? Um, what did you all end up doing with them? Well, <laughs> part, part of the core contract was that two, three of the buildings had to be demolished. Okay, um, and so we did that. That was part of the contract. And so those buildings were demolished. Of course, those buildings were not, the renovation itself would have, would have been out of, out of reach there. Um, the other building, um, the middle school uh, was given back to the county, which is something that I think we have to do if we're no longer using. Uh, the building, it is it is uh, reverted back to the county and they've built a, um, a social service department from that. Um, and so, uh, so three, we had to demolish three buildings. Uh, one of them went back uh, to the county and then the other building, which is the career center, we're keeping that building at this time uh, for just storage and, and it's just part of our campus. So we, we have that building. Dr. Sears, I know you said some of yours was pretty old. <laughs> what was your plan for those remaining buildings? We still have them currently. We've been uh, uh, selling off the, the surplus that wasn't needed for the new building, which was pretty much everything. And uh, they, uh, uh, the plan is to return them to the county. We're keeping uh, uh, the old ag shop at one of the schools and the, the, the bus garage was on the property of one of the schools. So we will keep those at, for our operations department, but we will be turning over both uh, school buildings to the county and they already have investors who are interested in converting them into housing. Mm -hmm. Okay. Other gentlemen, anything else you're 
the building uh, for Colonial Beach uh, was demolished at the end of the service. So, yeah. Our goal is that the high schools um, will both become centers for, we have three elementary schools that yet need to be upgraded. And so we have a plan in place for that. And we will be bringing the students from Clarksville Elementary School and Chase City Elementary School to Bluestone High School while we're renovating those buildings. And we'll be bringing the students from uh, La Crosse Elementary School to Parkview High School during the year that it takes to renovate those, that building. And everything else will be turned back over to the county uh, when, when we're done with it. Um, one of the facilities, Parkview program, the town of South Hill, it's right, it adjoins the town of South Hill and they want that facility for the recreational purposes after we get done with it. Thank you. So the next question, Dr. Turner, I'm gonna start with you. Um, what impact did the new building have on your students and community? So, so one of the first things that, I, that I've noticed since I've been here is the increase in usage you know, the um, being a, a school in a small school community, you don't have a lot of um, areas where the population of the community can gather to hold programs and functions and things of that nature. So in my last, uh, in my three years being here, that has in increased tremendously. Uh, we've worked with uh, the local government. We've worked with uh, fire and rescue on programs and trainings and things of that nature. So that's one of the first things that happened. The other impact from uh, that I've noticed is based on our students who transition from the new elementary school to the 40 year old high school building. And they quickly notice the difference in lighting, the difference in space um, and, and ask <laughs> questions all the time with regards to the, the opportunities to upgrade the building. Um, so those, those are two quick things that I've, that I've, I, that I've picked up on classroom furniture and things of that nature, um, where we just need in Colonial Beach to focus our efforts to bring the high school now up to speed. Because if it's that glaring to the students, you know, we want to make sure we make those adjustments. And right now is a really good time for us to, to make that focus uh, for our student population. So those are two of the quick things that I've picked up on since I've been here. Deal. Um, Dr. Sears, then Ms. Robinson. Go ahead, sir. Okay, thank you. Uh, you know, it, it, it was a, a huge boost for our community. Uh, you know, kids are actually able to, to focus in class because uh, it, it's not 95 degrees, you know, when, when school starts. And, and uh, you know, it, it's our facility. It's beautiful. It, it's in a highly visible part of the county. So it, it's kind of have be, it's become the pride of the county, at least currently, because it's this great new facility and uh, we were able to increase our uh, program offerings to have a middle school drama program and a robotics and a uh, full-time foreign language instructor for middle school. And, uh, you know, we, we are, are eight, uh, you know, I, I don't know how everybody, how familiar everyone is with our geography, but we're in, in an area where we, uh, you know, we're near Roanoke and Montgomery County and, uh, you know, and our school system and our graduates need to be able to, to compete against uh, uh, those larger uh, uh, school divisions and, and who have invested well in their school system over the last decades, whereas we didn't. So, but we feel like it puts us on par with, with everyone in our region now to be able to offer a, a quality education. And, and it's the difference between night and day, you know, in the attitude of the kids coming in that they are, they are proud of the building. You know, we've had a few, uh, little things done that middle schoolers will do, but for the most part, they, they step up and take care of it as well as the adults in the building do. Well, uh, and you'll just have to shorten my time here, but um, our high schools had no sign slabs. Um, our older high schools, um, to play sports, they had to travel. To practice sports, they had to travel. Um, Ridgeview um, is located that we have science labs, we have an auditorium, um, we have drama, we have art, 
uh, all of our athletic fields are located in this um, in this campus. Uh, we didn't Dixon County didn't have a track, and so our students would compete at the track at the state level, and they had never been on a on a real track. Um, I guess the best way I could describe it um, is that, and test scores aren't any everything, uh, and I'm the first one to share that with you. Before Ridgeview, um, Dixon County was probably um, out of 133 counties, we were lucky uh, to come in um, 120, 125, um, you know, in SOL scores. Um, now we were, um, the not last year, but the years before, uh, we were in the top 25. Uh, we have robotics teams that have um, competed all over the world. We have a wind vane. We have, um, um, on, a, on, a, on a beautiful afternoon, um, I love to go up there because we'll have soccer game going on. We'll have the baseball team there. We'll have the softball team there. We'll have uh, the tennis match going on. Uh, we might even have a track meet. And I know that, and many of you know this, for a small community, that's what it's all about. That's the community. And so when a school becomes that in a community, um, it's just a, a very special place. And so um, I think, um, uh, I think it's just transformed uh, people that said, our kids don't need any better to, um, I wish I could go back and, and go back to school, okay? Or I wish I could teach here. And so we're very thankful for that. That was perfectly said. Uh, Mr. Nichols? Well, this building has been transformative for the county as well. I mean, the, again, we, we were a split county east and west. A huge part of this was to bring the community together. And through the years as it's been built, I've have heard from so many people that said, Man, that building, that, that is quite something. That's going to be great for Mecklenburg County. And the idea of having the fine arts uh, able to participate with the 1200-seat auditorium. Uh, we've got so many acres that they'll be able to come in and, and you know, have Fourth of July fireworks and things like that outside. Um, the, this will be the first time that our, our high school teams have not had to completely separate the, the seasons of sports because the the uh, outfield for the baseball at both schools was the football field. And so that was always an issue. We've got room now for, for them to be able to come together and practice and, and do everything together. Um, they're excited. I mean, little things, which aren't so little, but to, to many, but huge to us, um, like we'll have a turf field. And, and that'll be huge for everybody to know that we, we've really got some state-of-the-art things going on. So it's, it's, been, it's been huge. And I know we're going to see significant improvement with academic programs as well as sports and everything else. Awesome. Well, thank you, Keith. I feel like I'm right within the time. Um, wow. Panelists, thank you so much. It, I know it helped me and I know that it helped everyone else just to hear your journey throughout this process. And, and, and may I say, uh, and I don't mean to interrupt, but may I say one more thing? And I know I want to thank Dr. Perigen for his time. And this has just been such a wonderful conference. But um, if you are in the building, if you're going to build, uh, or if you're thinking about that, my, and Dr. Sears will agree, and, and Dr. Nichols and, and all of us on this panel says, don't give up. You know, if you're told no the first time, then just keep asking. And you're going to be told no a hundred times. You're going to have mountains. You're going to you're going to think that the project is is doomed and and give up. But I guess my my best advice um, as I look back in those years is is just don't give up and don't give up for the children you serve um, because it will be well worth it for them. Thank you. Yeah. Amen. Thank you. Absolutely. Absolutely. So again, thank you all, Keith. Thank you for this opportunity to moderate this wonderful panel of my colleagues. And I will turn it back over to you. Thanks, Christy, and great job moderating. So I'm going to, since Haiti's given advice, I'm going to take the liberty to give advice too. 
Uh, I'll, I'll give you two pieces of advice before we uh, allow ESG to have some closing remarks and then open the mic for everybody to have a conversation if they would like to do so. Uh, the first piece of advice, and this panel is especially true of that, uh, if you want to be successful in life, surround yourself with good people. Uh, I didn't, um, you know, our presenters today, this panel discussion today, I do think it was a great conference but it doesn't have anything to do, here's what it has to do with, is we have a great board of directors for the Coalition of Small and Rural Schools, and we had great people presenting, especially ending the day with folks who are as passionate about what they do as the folks that we had on this panel. I, I just sent Haiti a text. She, she actually gave me chills as she was talking about the impact the new school facility had on their community. So surround yourself with good people and get out of their way. The second piece of advice is, you know, sometimes when you build a new school, it means you have to consolidate. And you heard our, our panelists talk about that today. Uh, Haiti and I used to have a colleague, he's went on to greener pastures now, but he had a great analogy for that. He was a hunter and he did, he hunted in Africa. He hunted all over the, in the, in the Rocky Mountains. He, I mean, he harvested more animals than you could even begin to think of. And he asked me one time, he said, you know, Keith, what the hardest animal in the world to kill is? I said, you know, no, but I was really interested to learn. He said, it's a school mascot. So if you have to <laughs> that, that in mind, because that, uh, that will definitely come back to haunt you. And so, school callers. <laughs> so, but anyway, that is, uh, thanks, thanks panel. That was a great job. And uh, thanks to all of our sponsors again. Thanks to the board of directors of, of the Coalition of Small and Rural Schools and all of our special guests. I do think we had a great conference. But let's not stop here. Let's keep our advocacy efforts going. Let's support the Crumbling Schools Tour uh, that we'll be having uh, uh, throughout the course of the summer. And let's make sure that we do advocate and stand up for our kids and make sure that their zip code doesn't have an impact on the learning environments in which they're, they're in. So with that, I'd like to turn it over to Cheryl, our title sponsor with ESG for any closing remarks. Just real quickly, I just would like to say, you know, how great this has been. Um, I, I was fortunate to listen in on the commission presentation as well, and the information is just, um, it's staggering uh, what's going on in the state. And so, you know, I commend all of you, not only with what you've had to deal with over the last year, year and a half, for heaven's sakes, um, but, you know, that these unprecedented times, they just can, they continue on. Um, now you're, you're faced with funding that you didn't have before and what do we do and how do we use it and how do we best use it and making those decisions. And so I really just commend you for the job that you're doing, uh, working with the coalition, it, you know, what you're doing there is great for the small and rural schools of Virginia. So stick together, hang in there, not be dead. Um, and then too, if there's anything that we can do to help you um, from a standpoint of renovations or improvements or air quality or whatever it may be, we're certainly here to do that. Um, that's that's our point is, is to help the school systems across the state. So anything we can do, we're more than happy to, to sit down and talk with you to go through that. And don't forget my invitation for golf. I wanna get out there. So somebody call me up and let me know when I can come take you out. Thank you, you guys have a great afternoon. Thanks Cheryl, thank you ESG and thanks to all of our other sponsors. With that, everybody uh, feel free to go answer all the emails that you've missed this afternoon. But anybody that would like to stay on and chat, we, we don't anticipate there'll be any song and dance, but the mic will be open for anybody who wants to stay and talk about school infrastructure uh, for the next little bit. Thank you very much. Thank you, Keith. Thank you, everyone. Dr. Warner, it's awful good to see you today. You're, you're muted, sir. Yeah, thank you so much, Keith. Uh, uh, it, it's really interesting because so many of these folks and places uh, are part of my memory banks, uh, the places I've worked. And uh, you and others know, of course, that uh, the League of Women Voters uh, in Washington and uh, Montgomery County are going to be doing a major study on equity uh, in both uh, economic uh, and uh, political and of course the uh, infrastructure is a major part of that. So appreciate uh, being able to sit in and, and participate. Thanks so much for your leadership. Good to see you, my friend. Thanks, Keith. All right.
Hey, Keith, this is Tom Smith. Um, great conference today. I also want to let you know while we we're talking about this, I contacted AASA on this extension of the uh, ARP fund to 2026. They weren't aware of it, of it being an issue, but I'm going to bring it up. We have a, a national call on Wednesday with other lobbyists, and we're going to discuss it. But if those folks who have contacts with ASA, whether it's Noel or anybody up there, they may want to start talking this up a lot. And I think that we can at least put it on their radar screen. Oh, Tom, that I'm telling you, that would be huge. Right now, the, the issue that we have, with, the reason that USED is not recommending or discouraging school construction is because we can't get it done by 2024. If we can get that extension to 2026, I think the uh, floodgates uh, would actually be open. Hi, I just wanted to go ahead and jump in on here. Uh, thank you so much for this conference. This has been super informative and really helpful. Uh, just a quick introduction. So I'm the Director of Advocacy at the Association of School Business Officials International. We work in lockstep very closely with AASA at the national level. Uh, Noel is my other half. Uh, we generally uh, advocate on uh, a lot of these issues. So this is super helpful to flag. Um, and I'll definitely bring it up with Noel as well. So thank you so much um, for at least just letting me know that that's not on their radar. Uh, because I think this is definitely an important topic that uh, we can kind of explore. I had mentioned in the chat earlier that, you know, obviously there are some politics at play at the national level with the Department of Education. And just to kind of flag uh, for, you know, some of the folks on this um, meeting, what, what we're kind of hearing is there's this difficult balance where the current administration, the Biden administration is trying to show that yes, schools need American rescue plan dollars. They need school infrastructure dollars. And people conflate uh, financial need with having to spend those dollars quickly. Uh, so some of the conversations that we've been having you know, with federal officials is to let them know that just because these dollars aren't being spent immediately, doesn't mean that that's reflecting the actual need of school districts across the country, not just for recovering from COVID, but as well as with school infrastructure needs. Uh, and that's why there's been this difficult ask uh, with the Department of Education to extend this, this timeline for spending the funds beyond 2024. That's not to say that we're going to give up and we're going to stop advocating on this. I still think it's it's definitely worth pushing, and especially if people on um, this, this group will reach out to their elected officials and say, no, we really need this extended because we have significant infrastructure needs. And it's just the, the fact of the matter is that these projects take time uh, to carry out. So, you know, 2024 is, is, is helpful, but not as helpful as 2026. Uh, but thank you, uh, Keith, and thank you, Tom, for flagging this, because I'll, I'll definitely take this information to Noel, and we'll have some discussions on this, as well as with uh, Mary Filardo uh, with the Basic Coalition, because we're also a member of this coalition as well. So really appreciate you bringing this issue to our attention. Great, thanks. Uh, and I appreciate that. Yeah, I appreciate that. I think with the logic that uh, that Keith brought up, that you know localities have till 2026, then why can't schools? You know, that's I think that's part of the argument. We're not asking to go past that, but logically it makes sense that if if your governing body can do it, then you ought to be able to do it also. Yeah, and I'll be sure to get uh, Alan Pratt with the National Ed Association as well. Um, obviously, the the louder our voice, the, the better our chances. Absolutely. And, you know, here at ASBO International, we're happy to work with your organizations if there's, you know, some some desire to really try to get, uh, you know, your voices amplified on the Hill on this issue. All right. Anybody else want to uh, chime in and add to the discussion? Keith, I'd just like to, it's Eddie from uh, Northampton. I'd just like to invite everybody over on July the 29th to take the uh, crumbling stool tour of Kip Peak Elementary. Uh, ABM's uh, one of our sponsors and they're they're doing the turnkey job for us here. So invite everybody to come over and see what's going on. 
Thanks, Eddie. I've never been to Northampton. I think I may make the trip. Thank you so much, Eddie, for saying that. This is Chrissy with ABM. I actually am just about to click send for the flyer to invite everybody that was here to the event over to Keith Perrigan. Dr. Perrigan, I hope you don't mind sharing that with the attendees and let's drum up some excitement to show everybody what Dr. Lawrence, or what Mr. Lawrence has going on at Northampton County Public Schools. Well, you know, Chrissy, uh, ABM's doing projects at both of our elementaries and the biggest ones at Kip's Peak, the next year they finish off our other one but on the crumbling school tour, we could do the whole county because our high school and middle school are also being renovated starting next year. So we're we're excited, but overworked at the moment trying to juggle all this different, <laughs> all these different things. You know, it's, Eddie, it's so exciting. Yes, like we, and um, you're right. I, I think our intention is 100% to showcase just how we're going from crumbling to thriving, really. So we'll share the excitement on what we have on multiple levels at the buildings, but make it so that it's still um, accessible and inviting, encouraging um, event for everybody who comes. Oh, we're gonna hold you to it too. We're excited about having the whole, the whole Commonwealth there that day. Oh, we're very excited, Mr. Lawrence, absolutely. So I'm, um, you'll be seeing the flyer as it gets distributed to through COSARS. And um, sorry, I didn't wanna take any time to flag that while we were doing all our presentations. These speakers have been amazing, uh, both in their content, their resumes. So Dr. Perrigan, I gotta say, you know, way to go. We're gonna just great effort from you and your entire team. Get out of their way. I will flag uh, in the chat, Dwayne Yancey, he's the editorial uh, director of the Roanoke Times. You know, if we want folks to know about our problems, we sometimes we just gotta open our hearts and share them. And I know the Roanoke Times has carried a lot of pieces about school infrastructure. I know your local, local papers will as well. I encourage you, to write uh, an editorial even about that. I'm sure that uh, as we get further into the summer, I'll do the same. But uh, we tweeted earlier today the schedule for the Crumbling Schools Tour and VASCD retweeted it out with this comment, the fact that Virginia is having a Crumbling Schools Tour should say enough. And hopefully uh, having, having uh, drawn attention to this, even though sometimes it is uncomfortable, we really need to do that. We need to make sure folks know our stories. Keith, I was, uh, I was just going to make the observation, you know, when you get to be very old, you remember people from different places. You know, I go back to uh, remembering Haiti when she was in Wise County years and years ago. And I know my son, Scott, who uh, lives in Mecklenburg, had kept me uh, pretty much apprised of the, of the challenges going on there over the last seven or eight years. And now, of course, he's down with Mark Lindenberg uh, using that uh, uh, new approach to fund the schools there. So again, uh, it, it's deja vu all over again. Thank you much again. Yes, sir. All right, well, it looks like that we're coming to an end. If anybody has questions, uh, feel free to email me. Um, I, we will get all the presentations and the recordings put up on our website and we'll let everybody know when that occurs. Uh, we will get all invitations to the Crumbling school, Schools Tour out as well. We do have the Save the Date out. We hope that you will share that. We hope that you'll invite your legislators, your school board members, your boards of supervisors, your city councils, and your media to all these tours, as many of them as you can get to. Uh, again, thanks everybody so much. We appreciate you and look forward to working together on this topic as we move into the summer. Have a great day.